Good afternoon and welcome to our CFA Boston Sustainable Investing Webinar on Addressing Climate Change as a Systemic Risk, a Call to Action for U.S. Financial Regulators. I'm Michael Grice, Principal of Riverbend Advisors and Chair of our CFA Boston Sustainable Investing Initiative. I'll be your moderator for today's session. Joining me today are Stephen Rothstein and Rina Romani from Ceres. We've divided today's conversation into three parts. First is a brief outline of the case for climate as a systemic risk. This is not simply why climate change is a front burner issue. At this moment, it is in our faces in a way it has not been before. Two huge disasters at the same time, the staggering scope of the wildfire in the West and the record flooding happening right now from a hurricane slowed by the impacts of climate change is unprecedented. It's the explicit case that this is a systemic risk that's critical here. The regulators of our financial system are charged with identifying and planning for systemic risks. So the second part of our conversation is a walk through the US regulatory landscape, the role of the multiple regulators and the recommendations for how each can address the risks of climate change in the context of their mission. Finally, we'll look at the follow-up from this report, the impact that it's already had and the next steps. Stephen and I began talking about doing this event in late July, but the timing of this session was very deliberate, as you'll see when we get to the discussion about the just released report from a subcommittee appointed by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and led by someone very familiar to the sustainable investment and mainstream investment community. So some brief housekeeping to help you navigate our technology and get the most out of your time today. Please use the Q&A box to ask questions as we go along. We'll break after each of the three portions for questions on those portions, and then again at the end for all any and all questions. You'll also see a handout box. We have two handouts available to you. We'll reference those in the report, and those are things you can look at and download uh, while we're talking uh, and while the seminar is going on. So with that, I will turn it over to Stephen Rothstein uh, of Ceres to introduce himself and Ceres and Vina. Stephen. Great, Michael, thank you so much. A deep thanks to you, uh, Gary, and the CFA Society of Boston and all of your colleagues uh, for all the organization and to everyone listening in today and, and watching. We appreciate your time. We know how um, frenetic life is generally and even more so because of all of the challenges that Michael talked about at the beginning. So uh, before, just again, my our heart on behalf of Vina and myself and our colleagues at Ceres, our hearts go out to everyone at this time, and we hope that everyone is healthy and their families are, are, are as okay as possible in these times. Um, we wanna get started, but before that, we wanna ask you a question. Uh, so, so Michael's gonna help load that and really wanna get your perspective. So many of you have participated in others. Um, so does your organization address climate change as part of your investment process? And for attendees, there's an opportunity to select either yes or no. Um, and so if you can go ahead and, and start to fill those out, uh, we very much would love your perspective. And then in a few, uh, in a little while, we'll show the results of that. Um, again, just also want to, as Michael said, introduce my colleague, uh, Vina. Do you want to say hello, Vina? And then Vina will be talking in just a little while. Vina? Hi. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. You would think after, you know, all this, all these months, um, you know, essentially living on GoToWebinar and Zoom, we would occasionally remember to unmute ourselves, but apparently that doesn't always happen. So hi, everyone. My name is Veena. Um, Veena Ramani. I'm a senior program director here at Ceres, um, working with Stephen on our initiative to uh, engage financial regulators on the systemic risk associated with climate change. Great. So. Thank you, Vina. And again, you'll hear a lot more from Vina in just in just a little bit. So I think the question, Michael, maybe we can go to the answers if they've been coming in. Um, mm -hmm. And sure. if sure great, so uh, yes, 63% and no, 38%. Fascinating. Well, that is great, and congratulations to all of you uh, that that are doing that. We hope that others that aren't haven't had had a chance. It's something that you think about that as part of that. So now if we can go back to the slides and the next slide um, uh, as part of that, but I, I'm just gonna spend a minute on series. Some of you have worked with series and we're doing involved with a variety of things and not just today, but if there are ways that you think we can collaborate with you, let us know. 
we started a, a series of a nonprofit. It's based in Boston, but uh, we're, we're folks all over. Uh, started over 30 years ago, and uh, we have a variety of kind of major focus. Our first work is with the investors. So we started over 30 years ago, and today we represent from small, medium, and very large size investors, including BlackRock and CalPERS and others, on their sustainability decisions. We don't make investment decisions, but um, looking at looking at a variety of sustainability issues. And it's a large portfolio, very active, one-on-one -on -one and collectively. Second is with companies, so some of the Fortune 500 companies uh, we represent, and uh, in across sectors, and we often work with them behind the scenes on their energy planning, their electric vehicles, their food, their forestry. So many of the announcements you'll see from a company, we've been working with them behind the scenes on those. Then we have a policy network, work in Washington and a number of states. And then uh, uh, the next slide, we have the accelerator, um, um, which is the official name is the Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. And the accelerator, the rest of Series does really important work working with key investors, key companies, key policymakers, one-on-one -on -one basis. The accelerator tries to look at system change. How do we change big systems? So today we're gonna to be talking about the regulatory structure, but we're doing another one, another initiative with Paris Align Portfolios, working with investors on that piece of it. Uh, Vina, among her other many responsibilities, leading a governance work with boards of directors uh, and looking at those pieces. And then we're about, about a month from now, we're releasing a report on the banking industry and how the, the some of the risks there, and I'm happy to talk about that as we go forward. So there are a variety of things and we look forward to partnering. I know we partner with some of you, we look forward to partnering with others. So next slide, please. What we did is first we looked at what are the system changes that are need, needed? And one of the big ones clearly are the regulatory areas. And so we looked both what's happening in the US and as all of you know so well, uh, unlike many other countries, our regulatory structure is such that there are key decision makers at the state level and at the federal level. Um, and so we conducted a lot of research and Vina took the lead on this and deeply appreciative of all of that and understand that and understand, okay, well, what would be the impact of some of those regulatory changes on business? And it's pretty dramatic. We can talk about that soon. So the next slide, then we looked around the world um, and there's an enormous amount of progress and then issued this report, which again, I think many of you have seen, if not, will be, I think there's a link in the um, handout section and we can also send it to people afterwards if you, if you're, if you need it in other, other ways. This report was issued in June and it addressed um, several federal agencies and then the state agencies, insurance and to some extent banking uh, uh, regula regulatory agencies. And to do this, first we started by looking at what's happening around the world. So not what environmentalists are saying, but what are central bankers saying? What are regulatory agencies like the SEC and other countries saying? And there is an enormous amount there. So all of the recommendations, and there's over 50 recommendations in this report, all of them are really recommendations that other central bankers, other securities exchange, other prudential supervisors are doing ar around the world. And to look at, and then we and then we also looked at what's happening in the U.S. And again, all of these recommendations are recommendations that regulators could act on today. Um, that they don't need legislation. While there is legislation in Congress, and we can talk about that, and we fully support it, legislation would always help to solidify it. Uh, ensure that it's in place, but regulators, just as, as we've seen today, uh, we've all seen today, this year, that regulators have really stepped forward, particularly the Federal Reserve, but all of them, because of the pandemic. And they said that's a real and present risk to our market, to the stability of our system. What can they do to minimize that risk? And they've done a, uh, a fascinating job, a lot of great things, and, and really kept things going in many ways. That's, those are examples of the powers that they have. And if we go to the next slide, that we think those are also relevant for the crisis we're facing today. Michael so eloquently said when he you know, started kind of highlighting the crisis we're facing today about whether it be the fires out west, um, the smoke in the Pacific Northwest, the hurricane in the in the Gulf, 
uh, and so many other areas. That's just this week alone. Never mind if you look back over the last few months. Many of you may have seen the articles about what's happening in Greenland and the Arctic Circle. It's just unfortunately we're setting new records in a bad way. The first portion of the report talks about the issue of climate as a systemic risk. And it makes the case, and it's to be honest, a pretty easy case to make, that climate is a systemic risk. It's not, meaning it's not just a risk if you're if you're in the, the coast of Miami Beach. It's not just a risk if you're in San Francisco because of the fires, but it's everywhere. And it's a risk for, and, and, and there's three big buckets. First, there is a physical risks, fires, floods, droughts, uh, 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 tornadoes, other, th other risks. Um, and those are happening more frequently and in more parts of the country. And there's almost, almost no place that isn't at risk for something whether it be, again, a tornado, a hurricane, a, a drought, floods, fires at some point, and, and you can just look back at some of these maps. We have in the report over two, uh, sorry, over 200 uh, citations of different underlying uh, materials. So, because we're not meteorologists, um, but we cite experts who are. Um, so there's the physical risks. Those physical risks, you know, will affect uh, people's homes will affect banks, will affect the supply chain. Just as we all remember in March, the supply when the pandemic started, how the supply chain was disrupted. Now imagine as awful as what we're facing today, and it is heartbreaking at so many levels, um, the pandemic will have, there will be therapeutics or a vaccine in the, at some point, um, and we will, it will get better. I don't want to say it'll go back to where it was, but it will get better. For climate, there's no vaccine. Uh, it's not going to. It just is, unless we make systemic and ongoing changes to the carbon output of our society, it's going to get exacerbated and exacerbated. And literally, you just have to turn on the evening news to see examples to that. And that will lead to one of the other challenges that our country is going to face of climate migrants. We're going to have, depending what year you look at, tens of millions of people that won't be able to live or work where they're living or working now. Um, and we see that in, in a, in a short-term way, but we're gonna see that over and over again. The second big risk, and go to the next slide, please, is the transition risk. Um, that as we go from a, uh, to a lower uh, carbon economy, that there's gonna be tens of millions of dollars, tens of billions and trillions of dollars lost. Just in the last two months alone, Sorry, we've seen tens of billions of dollars lost. If you look at the oil companies, just from BP and Shell and Total, just those three alone, they've written off about $35 billion in the last 60 days alone, just those three alone. So that number is gonna grow. And, uh, and that means our financial system, that's 35 billion that's held by investors or bankers, insurance companies, and, and that's gonna grow. There's also legal risks and other risks. So there's a large and systemic risk. And we spend a lot of time in the report talking about that because our, the regulators, and we'll, and we'll talk about this in just a few minutes, we've had many, many conversations with regulators. There are different stages of information. Some understand the details and some are at different stages in, in what they know. So we wanna kind of make that case. Um, the next slide, please. Um, is really to open up for questions. So I'll turn it back to you, Michael, if you have questions or if the audience do. Thank you. Yeah, let me start. And again, uh, just a reminder to everyone to please add, ask questions. And again, we will take we'll you know take questions at the end too. So you don't have to limit yourself. But if you have questions on what we've talked about so far, please add them. Uh, one that, that I have for you is as you did this research, I think many of us who work in this space, it's almost like you're asked to talk about why is this important? Why is it systemic? You're almost overwhelmed. There's so much information. What have you found as you, you know, look through the reports? What other regulators? What was the what was most uh, impactful for those folks of the things? It's not just you know a hurricane or the wildfires. What are the things you're, you think are most impactful for regulators that you've seen elsewhere, and you think are in, in your initial conversations uh, after the report? But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves on that. Uh, um, let me start. But I'm for all these, Vina, jump in at, at any point. And again, I I, I can't. Thank Bean enough. She did the uh, the bulk of the research and the writing of the report, and and deep, deeply appreciate. We wouldn't be here without her expertise. Um, so I think the answer is 
um, it varies on who you talk to. So for some people, the physical risks, they're in, you know, they turn on the paper or they're out west, they see the fires or they're in, they're on the coast, one of the coasts. And so they, they or they know people affected by that. Other people are saying, you know, that the transition risks could actually happen faster, um, depending on who the president is, what the makeup of Congress looks like. Uh, you know, if, for example, we have a carbon tax and, and there it is not unlikely in the next Let's say if there is a different administration, and in my in series, we don't take positions. We work with all parties and, and everything. But if there's a different administration, there's no, no without being partisan, there's no surprise that uh, Vice President Biden has emphasized a number of climate issues. So there's likely to be a lot more climate regulations. There may or may not be a carbon tax. So within the next four years, the, there could be a significant transition risk. So I think it varies who we talk to. That's my perspective. Vina, jump, feel free to jump in. No, I, I, I agree with that, Stephen. And the only point I think I have to add to this is that um, that these impacts don't happen in isolation, right? So transition risks are impacted by physical risks, right? The, the social and the community risks that Stephen outlined, the, the health impacts, the climate migration that we're already starting to see, that, that exacerbates the, the transition risks. And what I think you know, scary about climate change and, and what really has led to sort of the, the systemic risk designation is that this is a situation where one plus one doesn't necessarily equal two, right? We, we don't know how these risks interplay with one another and, and what the outcome will be. So it is that unpredictable nature of the, the cumulative effect of all these risks sort of playing into one another, which is what sort of leads to climate change being a systemic risk. And we're seeing that again play out in the pandemic right now, right? How a, 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 a health issue that essentially arose in China has essentially brought the whole world to its knees. It, because we live in an interconnected world with interconnected supply chains, and that's going to be true of climate change impacts as well. So, so that's why this issue is, is scaring folks in the regulatory community, certainly. Um, globally, and, and that's why, um, as we'll start to talk about in just a minute, you are starting to see the U.S. regulatory community as well start to engage on this issue. I want to ask them, too, about the, the question of the transition risk and your slide, which says, you know, unplanned, unplanned transition. Uh, I think a lot of the conversation that people are hearing, and, and properly so, is the opportunities in the transition to a zero carbon, low carbon economy. And obviously, you say, okay, yes, that's going to have serious impacts on oil companies and stranded assets. But at the same time, the report really makes the point that an unplanned transition, it, it's going to happen, right? If we're not leading it, it's still going to happen around the world. And that has a set of, another set of risks that go beyond that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, the one thing we've learned, if, 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 we, if we had any doubt before this year, what we've been retaught in 2020 is in the end, Mother Nature wins. Um, that, you know, as smart as human beings are and as creative as we are, what we can do is we can plan, we can prepare, and that will impact Mother Nature. It won't stop Mother Nature. And if you just look around the world, countries that have planned well are having a, a, a less of an impact on the pandemic. It's still affecting them. And those countries, again, without getting into politics, that haven't planned as well, it's affecting them more. The same on climate. Um, you know, do you prepare for the hurricane um, the day before it's coming and put wood on the windows, or do you? does it affect building codes? Does it affect where you plan houses, whether you build barriers or kind of resistance? You know, our country has done a great example. I'll look at building codes. You know, 100 years ago, after a hurricane would come in, a lot more places, or today, unfortunately, in many parts of the world, a lot, there's a lot more destruction because of building codes. After a hurricane or a tornado, the, the, the officials rewrite the building codes and the buildings get stronger. That's a that's an, a great example of planning. You can't stop a hurricane, but you can be more prepared for it. We can do the same thing from a climate perspective. And so we're you know we're not there's no one answer. H. L. Mencken, the writer and author and reporter, once said, "For every complex problem, there's a simple answer that's always wrong." You know there is no simple answer here to solve. There's lots of pieces, but part of it is planning ahead will reduce the cost, and that's both in human life and in financial and disruption, 
Um, and also it'll give us time to be creative, you know, to, 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 to readjust our economy. Uh, uh, we can't do that overnight in an effective way. Um, but we can, if we have time, we don't have a lot, we don't have a lot of time. We have to start now, but if we say, okay, what, where are we going to be by 2025? Where are we going to be by 2030 and have real benchmarks that fundamentally we believe, series believes that we can uh, go forward, but it, we, it can't go forward without the regulators. Regulators aren't the only actors, obviously individuals, investment companies, legislators, governors, executives. But if you look around the world, as I said, that uh, regulators are, are part of that. So planning ahead is the one tool we still have, but we don't have a lot of time left. Let me ask one final question before we move on to the regulators. And that, you know, that concerns the reports and other, other things that have been done over the last few years, but really didn't get the attention and how you see some of those maybe coming back in. And the one I'll use, you mentioned climate migrants, and it, that's actually been in the news here in the US, uh, talking about the hurricane and what that might mean. But several years ago, more than several years ago, the US Department of Defense had, was doing a lot of threat assessment. And they talked very specifically about the threat to national security of climate migrants around the world. Um, and you know, one of the points made again, and I don't hear this much anymore, but the Syrian civil war, which was a huge impact in many ways, was largely driven by climate and, and changes that forced uh, losses in agriculture and you know the way of people moving within Syria. So you know, those things were, if you were in this community, you heard about it, but they weren't heard in the way that this is being heard. Do you see that some of these will now be you know, brought back and kind of added to sort of fuel to the fire, to forgive the expression? Yeah, I, I, I do. I think that you're exactly right. Many military leaders talk about climate uh, and the risks there and a variety of fronts, whether it be how to uh, soldiers in remote areas, how do they act, to the um, climate migrants, to the reliance on fossil fuels and what we're doing to defend that. In, 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 and there are many reports, including I think recently from the um, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, I think it's, but don't quote me on that, about saying climate is potentially the biggest risk over the next several years uh, in, in those areas. So absolutely those areas. And there are a lot of military officials who have, who have joined this um, uh, in, in this effort. Again, Vina, feel free to jump in at any point. The only thing for me to add there is, you know, what we've done, I mean, climate is such a large issue. It involves so many stakeholders, and I think a, a, a comprehensive solution will involve input from all the stakeholders, right? So, and that includes, you know, policymakers, that includes the investment community, right? Just in this call, we have around 30 people on the call, right? So, and we have a, a situation where, you know, around 65 to 70 folks talk integrate climate change into their investment decisions and 35% and don't. So you're right, there's like, so what is the role that the investment community plays in starting to think about to address and act on climate change? That's a part of the solution. What we've tried to address through this initiative in this report is a very, very specific slice of the picture, right? If climate change is a specific risk, how can it be addressed? But if climate change is a systemic risk, how can we, it be addressed by regulators responsible for financial market um, stability? That's a part of the solution, but we we'll need sort of solutions coming through literally from all parts of the sector, clearly including national security, as you've raised. Well, let's let's turn to the regulators now. Great. So if we can go to the next slide, and um, I'm going to do the overview, and then have Vina talk about kind of the agencies in, in more detail. As we say, there are over 50 recommendations. Uh, covering many agencies we're going to talk through, but there's a there's four basic points that kind of cut, cut across, excuse me. The first is we're asking every agency, federal and state, regulatory, financial regulatory agency, to affirm that climate is a systemic risk. That doesn't mean, we're not asking the Federal Reserve to be the EPA. The EPA will be the EPA, and there's, there's a lot to do there. But the Federal Reserve or the uh, FDIC or the SEC, their job in different ways are to provide that prudential supervision. And one of the risks they look at, just as they're doing a lot on looking at the pandemic risk, they have programs, they have analysis to look at currency risks and management risks. So we're just saying this is a real and present risk to our financial system. And first they should assert that it is. Once you say that, then you, th you think about all of your initiatives. And again, Vina will go through these. 
um, and, uh, and, and, and building it in to integrate it into their prudential supervision and there are a variety of details there. The third area, and this is more at the SEC level and then at some state areas, is to mandate climate change disclosure. Um, Sirius was very involved in 2010 when um, there was a voluntary climate disclosure put forward by the SEC, and that's a good step, but it's just a step. That we want mandatory. And the last is to coordinate. There's a lot of great learning. As I say, there's an international group. The Network for the Greening of the Financial Systems has 69 members, many countries, including and actually states like the state of New York joined on their own. Um, but we're really the holdout. If you look around, it's, it's, uh, there are countries from all over the world in that area. So those are kind of the high level areas. Next slide, please. Um, again, yeah. these are the areas, and Michael jump in at any point. Uh, well, I think um, this is where you, what we wanted to ask kind of the second question as you get into this slide uh, that we yep. had for folks. Um, and uh, we will put that up now uh, and ask that. So again, does your organization consider climate change disclosures to be sufficient for your needs of risk management? Um, we'd very much really welcome your thoughts on that and as, uh, get your feedback. That's very important as we go forward. Yeah, and, and I think I was, one, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, one um, in connection between sort of this question and the first question we've asked is, you know, if there was better climate change disclosures out there in the marketplace, you know, would that motivate um, those invest those of the uh, uh, folks on the call whose organizations don't consider climate change currently as a part of their investment analytics? Would they be more motivated? Um, would they have better disclosure to be able to factor into their thinking and their decisions? Great. I'll let you go ahead and I'm going to leave it open for a little bit longer. We've had a little over a quarter of folks vote and just encourage a few more. And if you want to get start, uh, continue on what you're doing, then I'll jump back in and put it out as soon as we finish. Great. When, whenever you're ready. So, um, again, there, there, are, there are several federal agencies um, and each what we did is went through each agency. And, and again, as I said before, when I say what we did, I really mean a deep appreciation for Vina and, and other team members that did this effort um, that uh, looked at what are their statute, what are their enabling legislation, what are their responsibilities, what are other examples where they've looked at um, other factors, whether it be nature-based or other other risks as part of that, and then so kind of why they should be doing it and what they should be doing. And Vina will go through agency by agency. So let me see if we want to go to the there. there you Fascinating. Does your organization consider climate change disclosure to be sufficient? 100% said no. Fascinating. Well, first, I appreciate that. Oh, that, that that's that's fascinating to see, and uh, we want to be helpful, and so that we can all think about that. I don't know if Michael or Vina have comments on that. That was a surprise to me. I mean, I, I think it's um. Yeah, I, I I think it's less of a surprise to me because what we've also seen over the past years is this sort of crescendo, the sort of juggernaut of investors starting to step out, calling for rules for climate change disclosure, calling for rules on ESG disclosure, as we certainly do in this report as well. I mean, what's true for financial regulators is equally true for investors, right? We, we, we want everyone to do that, um, invest, that analytics in terms of risk management, whether it's at a portfolio level or at a, at a, at a market level. Um, and you can't do that analytics in terms of risk management without the right information. While there has been, I think, a, a tremendous growth in the volume of corporate uh, climate change disclosures from companies, um, it's not consistent, it's not at scale, um, it's not always seen as reliable. And that's where um, regulatory action, we think, is, is critically important. Yeah, I think that's true. All the folks that we talk to when we do events, it doesn't matter whether they think, oh yeah, this is important and I'm starting to look at it or they have been doing this for a while. There isn't a single person who says, well, yeah, I got what I need. I can I can go ahead with this. So uh, in, in a sense, it doesn't surprise me, but I guess that's that's good. So uh, moving along, I think you can go to the, we can go to the next slide, right? Uh, yeah. Great, yeah, the next slide. So I think the next slide, um, where we, we, this gives an overview, and I'm going to turn it over to Vina, who's going to lead the next part of this. Vina? Great. Uh, thanks, Stephen. And so for the rest of the, for the next, I suppose, 20 minutes or so, 
what we'll do is sort of run you guys through each of the specific agencies that we took a look at for this report, both um, running you through our logic as to why we think these agencies have a role to play in addressing the systemic risk of climate change, as well as identifying specifically what we're looking for them to do. Um, as uh, Stephen said before, all of our analysis, all of our recommendations are premised on the role of financial regulators as they exist right now. So it, it's built on, built on the current mandate of these um, uh, regulators, though clearly we've seen a lot of draft legislation as well floating about. We think that the purpose of draft legislation in this context is to remove ambiguities, to um, really accelerate action, but it's not really needed um, to, uh, for the regulators to take up any of the recommendations that we've identified in the report. So let's begin with the, the biggest fish in the pond, which is clearly the, the Federal Reserve. So as um, for each of the agencies that we focused on, we began by making the case as to why we believe that the regulator in question should focus on climate change. Um, given that the Fed mandate is to foster the stability, the integrity, and the efficiency of US financial markets, the, the role that the Fed could play um, on climate change is, you know, seemed quite obvious to us. It's also worth noting that our inspiration for engaging in this initiative writ large really came from a lot of what we were seeing central banks globally do, including places like um, the Bank of England, clearly under the leadership of Mark Carney, uh, France, um, Australia, the Netherlands, and others, as well as some of what we were starting to observe from some of the regional banks of the Federal Reserve System, including notably San Francisco. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So what are we looking for the Fed to do? Um, as a first step, we've called on the Fed, we are calling on the Fed to affirm that climate change poses risks to financial market stability and essentially start to address what that stability means in terms of their particular mandates. Now, we know that this feels like a, a little bit of a chicken and an egg issue, right? What comes first, the research or the affirmation? But the reality is that we think that there is enough evidence out there, a lot of which we've compiled in the report and that Stephen has articulated, which proves that this is a systemic risk. What we need right now is, the, is to leverage the, the deep analytical power of the Fed into analyzing, okay, so what does this mean in terms of our own roles on supervision, our own roles on monetary policy, our own roles vis-a-vis -vis the various regional jurisdictions that we are involved with? Um, as a part of this, we think that um, the regional banks of the Federal Reserve System have a particularly important to play. We're also seeing many of the regional banks already start to step up on climate change in, in ways that are significant. I mentioned San Francisco before. The, the Fed of San Francisco last November convened a, a conference on climate change, um, which you know came out with a number of really excellent research papers. Um, we've seen the, the regional feds from places like um, Dallas and, and St. Louis start to issue small position papers and extreme weather events and impacts on their system. We know that the regional fed of Richmond is planning a, a, a conference on climate change as well in the near future. So there is a lot more activity happening on the, the regional uh, bank side. And we do call on the regional banks in the, the Federal Reserve System to both generate research themselves as well as coordinate with regional stakeholders. So, so you know, regional banking regulators, regional um, securities regulators, some of the, the relevant states in their jurisdiction to come up with an assessment of regional vulnerabilities and starting to think through how to address um, economic impacts that may be unique to their jurisdictions. Um, our next set of recommendations relates to prudential supervision, which is we think where a lot of the power of all the banking regulators, whether the Fed or whether we're talking about the um, OCC, the Office of the Control of the Currency and the FDIC um, start to come into play. So we call on the Fed, we call on all the banking regulators to start to figure out ways in which climate change could be integrated into their um, microprudential supervision of financial institutions. A big part of the way that this could play out is clearly through um, stress tests. Uh, we've seen a number of central banks globally announce climate change stress tests, including importantly, the Bank of England. Um, I know Australia um, has uh, is planning to do this as well. Japan in the past couple of months has announced that they will be conducting climate stress tests. Um, and again, starting to use the information from the climate stress test to actually factor into their own overarching um, risk assessment efforts. 
Um, we also think that there are, um, we've tried to be as creative as possible in addressing the issue of climate change disclosure. Just again, keeping in mind the full results that we've just seen, we, we suffer from it as well. So one role that we've mapped out from banking regulators that is getting some raised eyebrows, I must say, is calling on uh, some of the banking regulators to coordinate with the SEC to see what they might do to get their supervised institutions to provide more disclosures. Clearly, banks both are impacted by climate change, but also clearly contribute to climate change as well through their lending and investment activities. So um, really figuring out ways in which we could get as robust disclosure as possible from the financial services sector is something that we're looking um, to drive. Um, we also call on the Fed to take a page out of what we're seeing in Europe to figure out, is there a way for us to start to clarify what counts as climate friendly activities versus not? So again, the EU has done a lot of work in terms of its green taxonomy. So is there a, a coordinated global version that the Fed could be a part of is the question that we, we are calling on the Fed to explore. Um, next slide, please. Um, the other big power that the Fed had has clearly is as a part of their role on monetary policy, which we are seeing sort of you know play out in full force right now as the Fed coordinates responses to the current pandemic. You know, one question that we have there, and this is something that we are starting to see, um, we're starting to hear from the rest of the environmental community, is what are the climate change impacts of the current efforts to infuse more liquidity into the economy? So for instance, as the Fed starts to lend to certain sectors, as the, stand, the Fed starts to buy up certain, certain corporate bonds to shore up certain sectors, you know, to what extent could these efforts have the inadvertent effect of potentially worsening climate change? And so what we specifically call on the Fed to do, for instance, as a part of their efforts, as a part of the Main Street Rending Program, is to figure out ways to fold in climate change considerations as a part of loans they may provide or as a part of support they might provide. So again, here's another place where we do call on the Fed to say, can you fold in climate change disclosures as a part of what you call on um, these uh, sectors and, and companies you may be supporting to do. Again, we have an example for this. So in July, Canada um, tied um, loans that they were making to large companies as a part of their own economic stimulus package to TCFD-based reporting. Um, clearly, again, as loans are made, collateral is needed. We call on the Fed to factor in um, climate change as a part of pricing of collateral. Um, the Fed's economic outlooks assessments, these are called monetary policy reports, I believe, um, really sort of provide some baseline analysis of the sector, which is used um, in making monetary policy based decisions. We do call on the Fed to integrate climate change in there. Um, Stephen talked, Stephen and, and Michael, you did as well, talked before about climate migration. I think the, the reality is that um, like we see with almost every other risk we face, it is our, our you know, most vulnerable communities that are particularly impacted by these issues. So you know, the, the Fed, most banking regulators have a role to play in community reinvestment. So we do call on our, our banking regulators to figure out how to factor climate resilience in as a part of the community reinvestment efforts. Um, and finally, again, uh, ensure that any activity on this issue is a is a global um, globally coordinated effort. Stephen mentioned the the work being done as a part of the NGFS, the network for the greening of the financial system. Um, there's a lot of coordination happening in that agency. Um, every financial every a, a lot of central banks are a part of that group. The U.S. is an observer but not yet a member. But given that this is a global problem, we believe that any action going forward should um, all be coordinated through a global playbook of efforts. Um, any questions on the Fed in particular before maybe I power through the rest of the agencies a little bit quicker? I don't have any coming in and I think what I'll do unless you know something jumps in is I'll hold anything I have until the end so you can get through these and then we can talk about them together. Sure. All right, um, let's move on to the next slide, Monica. Great, so the next set of recommendations that we have are to the Office of the Controller of the Currency and the Federal Deposit Insurance Com Corporation. So for those of you on the line that might not be financial regulatory ecosystem mm -hmm. needs, these are the other major 
financial regulate the banking regulators in the in the regulatory ecosystem they are much more focused on financial institutions specifically so they are very very focused on ensuring the safety and the soundness of their supervised financial institutions that includes the, some of the largest financial institutions in the country which are the largest in the world as well as some more sort of uh, regional and, and smaller players as well so the case that we make here is look climate change clearly affects credit risks given sort of its impact on on collateral um it also uh, affects concentration risks where financial institutions may be um significantly exposed to industries that are significantly affected by climate change sort of causing a a cascading set of impacts in the world therefore you know we believe that these institutions um should these agencies should affect uh, should address climate change next slide please So what are we looking for these agencies to do? Again, here our recommendations, as I mentioned before, are very specifically about climate change, uh, about financial supervision. We call on these regulators to integrate climate change um, into their financial supervision efforts, potentially by um, coordinating a, 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 an interagency guidance statement on how banks should integrate climate change into their risk management efforts. You know, we, we also have a couple of recommendations here specifically about the examination process. So the way that this works is these regulators send bank examiners to work with banks to, again, assess the soundness of their risk management systems. At the end of the day, a lot of these, a lot of the role that um, these agencies play come to bear as a part of the examination process. So what we call on here is also to really work with examiners to help them understand how the agencies that how the institutions that they may be focused on um, to really to provide them with some training and guidance on how to assess where these institutions are exposed to climate risk and where they may be addressed so for instance the OCC has a handbook which it provides to its examiners or guidance to help them figure out where a bank is at risk versus not none of these guidebooks include any mention of climate change so you know that's a great place to start um with the the role of the fdic um also becomes important because they are essentially stewards of the deposit insurance fund which clearly underlies the the soundness of a lot of the financial institutions that many of us bank with so again given the impacts of climate change on banks we call on the fdic to also to not only think about climate change as a part of their supervisory role to also think about what climate change might mean to the deposit insurance fund itself. And again, based on the climate change exposure of specific banks, figure out how the premiums that they are charging to these banks to participate in the DIF process may need to change based on their climate change exposures. Next slide, please. And as you do that, we did one, it was really more of a comment, but an observation from someone that, uh, there are some uh, 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 potentially some models to follow on that, and specifically mentioning French banks having to account for climate risk in their loan portfolio. Yeah, no, that's great. And if you have, if anyone has resources that they think we should be looking at, um, I know that the last slide in this deck, I believe, is Stephen and my contact information. Please do send it to us. I have to say that this report as Stephen has mentioned has 250 citations but this has barely scratched the surface of what we know is happening out there so we are sort of constantly just trying to you know read new re reports sort of improve our own understanding on this issue so if there are reports you think we should read please do send those to us via email great just thank you for that so the next set of recommendations um, focuses on the market regulators. So we talked about the banking regulators before. The market regulators are the SEC and the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. SEC, a clearly sort of a, a critical agency um, as a part of this discussion. Their mission is to essentially ensure orderly and efficient markets and to protect investors right in the investment community has been shouting from the rooftops certainly over the past um, years that they think climate change is a critical issue that they need better information to address climate change so um, we think that the sec has a has a strong and important role um, to play um, in the issue of the systemic risk associated with climate change next slide please so what should the SEC do? Like with any agency, we call them to affirm the systemic nature of climate risks and to do the research on what it means in terms of securities markets in particular. 
Now, the SAC has a department called DIRA, the Division of Economic Research and Analysis, which we believe is particularly well situated to do this. So we um, call on them to sort of step up. Uh, our next recommendation to the SAC is, is one that I hope um, is close to all of your hearts. We call on the SAC to affirm that considering material ESG risk factors like climate change is consistent with investor fiduciary duty. I will say that the reason we even put this recommendation in is because of the, the signals that we were getting about the potential rulemaking that we've recently seen from the DOL on ERISA fiduciaries and, and some of the ongoing chipping away, I will say, of the freedom of investors to be able to address risks of any kind, but particularly ESG risks like climate change using all tools at their disposal. Given that the mission of the SEC is to protect investors, we believe that, you know, um, clear statements by them would go a, a long way in terms of affirming the ability of investors to um, act on climate change in any which way that they want to. Um, we, again, we've seen actions like this from um, securities regulators globally, and we've also seen a, a strong commitment to climate and ESG from IOSCO, which is the International Organization of Securities Regulators as well, which is a, a somewhat recent development. Third recommendation, you won't be surprised to see this from series, we call on the SEC to issue rules for um, climate change disclosure, building on the framework established by the TCFD. Again, rationale, I don't have to sort of talk about given that 100% of the people on this call think that climate change disclosures is inadequate. Um, next slide. Right, the next set of uh, recommendations that we have, and I won't go through this in detail, relates to um, accounting and auditing. So again, a, a significant part of the reason as to why investors think climate change disclosures is inadequate based on my understanding is in part it's seen as unreliable, right? Clearly there's a, a strong role that the auditing community could play in addressing this issue. Um, the SEC oversees the PCAOB, the Public, company, Public Companies Accounting Oversight Board. Um, and so we believe that there's a lot that the PCAOB could do in terms of really making sure that auditors follow a systematic process in being able to identify where climate change is not being addressed adequately as a part of corporate disclosures. Um, there was also a really interesting recent report by the National Whistleblower Center on climate change, which again talks about the fact that some industries may be intentionally underreporting some of the risks um, that they face from climate change that I would encourage you to, to look at as well. Um, and, and finally, we believe family has a role to play. So, uh, you know, um, apart, clearly companies are trying to figure out ways in which climate change could be shown in their balance sheets, but the way in which it is being shown, um, it, it tends to be the Wild West just because there is no, you know, guidance on this issue. So we believe that um, family has a role to play um, in driving consistency on how fine, uh, climate change is talked about in PNL, in balance sheets, and in financial statements at large. Um, next slide. Uh, finally, our uh, final recommendation to the SEC relates to credit ratings. Again, rationale, I don't need to make here. It's so fundamental to investment decisions being made overall. Now, there has been, I think, uh, a significant change um, in terms of the growing focus of credit raters on climate change, certainly over the past years. But there is, I think, um, less disclosure on how the sausage is actually made, what actually goes into making these decisions. And it's not clear if the greater focus on climate change by credit raters has led to changes in ratings decisions. So again, what we call on the, the Office of Credit Raters to do is to just extract more disclosure from ratings agencies on this question. Next slide. So the, the next slide focuses on the, the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Both Stephen and, and Michael talked about the, the recent report from the CFTC. So I, I won't belabor this except to say, at the end of the day, any risks that the security mar securities market faces is also going to show up in the commodity market. So commodity markets are as vulnerable to climate changes as the security market is writ large. Some of the, the commodities that are traded most significantly in the US are energy commodities, agricultural commodities, both of which clearly affected by climate change. So there's a role that the CFTC could play there. The, the recent CFTC report on climate change includes recommendations on what the CFTC itself should do as well. So we are eager to see um, those taken up. 
Next slide. And again, you know, our recommendations here is again for the CFTC to, you know, essentially endorse and, and really run with the report, um, as well as use the report's recommendations to enhance its own oversight of climate change risks as a part of the commodities and the derivatives market. Um, next slide. Uh, the next set of recommendations we have here um, focus on um, state and federal insurance regulators. Again, I won't belabor why the um, insurance industry, I will say, is at the bullseye <laughs> in terms of risk faced by climate change. Just some of the, the losses and the write-offs, for instance, associated with extreme weather events. Um, you know, I, I know we heard the CEO of Allstate say close to a decade ago that extreme weather events were the new normal. Right. And we, clearly at the part of this, insurance regulators need to have a better sense of how the insurance industry is addressing climate risk, both as a part of their products, but also as a part of their investments. Insurers, insurers tend to be the largest institutional investors in the world. Um, next slide. Again, a, a range of, of recommendations in terms of what the insurance regulatory ecosystem should do. Many of these are state regulators. Um, um, I will say that um, many state regulators in the U.S., particularly California, Washington, and others, are in fact stepping out um, on these issues in in, uh, de in a way that um, we have seen as, as real leadership. And again, details are available in the report. Again, here we call on um, regulators to ensure that insurance companies are thinking about climate change um, as a part of the actuarial process in terms of their products but also as a part of the investment process. Um, next slide, please. Um, again, uh, anything that we also encourage insurance regulators to get insurance companies to issue products for to, that are intended to address climate change risks. So to this end, we recently saw the, the commissioner of the, the California Insurance Commissioner uh, release a climate change database um, which actually um, encapsulates, you know, products associated with climate change that are coming out in the industry. So a really, you know, important and interesting step forward. Finally, of course, we think that the insurance regulators um, should um, and can uh, mandate climate change disclosures from insurance companies um, in their jurisdiction. Again, we've seen some state insurance regulators do this already, California, Washington, Connecticut, among others. Next slide, please. Um, our next set of recommendations focus on the Federal Housing Finance Agency. So this is an agency that focuses on risks to the mortgage market and here focuses specifically on the, the government sponsored enterprises, so Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. And this is a, a really fascinating and new area. So um, after our report was released, we saw a, a supremely disturbing um, report come out from a group called the First Street Foundation, which essentially makes the case that um, essentially prop 40, uh, close to 15 million properties in the country are at substantial risk associated with climate change. The fact is that people have to take flood insurance based on flood maps that are drawn by FEMA. And unfortunately, these flood maps are outdated because of climate change. So the reality is that a lot of our homes, commercial properties throughout the country are at risk from climate change, and there is no backstop because many of us haven't taken insurance. So again, we call on the FHFA to, um, next slide, please. So again, two sets of recommendations. We're calling on uh, the FHFA to first understand the risk that um, the mortgage industry faces from climate change and then start to figure out how to address it. So a part of this, again, the recommendations are here, mostly to work with the government sponsored institutions. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to figure out how to address um, climate change as a part of risk modeling, insurance, updating flood maps, shaping mortgage pricing, and again, ensuring that all of these solutions take into account um, impacts on low-income communities and figuring out ways to build their own um, resilience to the in inevitable impacts of climate change. Um, next slide, please. Final agency that we focused on is the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Now, the FSOC plays an important coordinating role within the, the financial regulatory ecosystem. 
So we call, again, final slide, next slide, please. So we call on the FSOC specifically to identify climate change risk as a vulnerability and um, make recommendations on regulations that regulatory agencies could adopt. And we also call on the FSOC to ensure that regulatory agencies are coordinated with one another. So as you've seen through the recommendations that I just laid out, a lot of the recommendations that we make are, you know, uh, recommendations where different agencies could overlap with one another. So we, play, we think that the FSOC could play a, a really critical coordinating role um, within the agencies that we've identified in this report, as well as agencies that we have not yet gotten a chance to get to. Right. So I Thank you, Veena. I think the next we'll open back to questions. Sorry, Veena, for interrupting you. Mike, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. I just want to remind everyone to use the question uh, Q&A to be able to ask questions as they go. Uh, this is a lot of information. I think for many folks, it's uh, maybe the first time they've seen the scope of regulatory agencies that are involved here. Um, could you talk a little bit about the interconnectedness of these agencies? And I think that really speaks to the FSOC, but I think for folks you may think, well, I'm, you know, I'm worried about this sectors, I worry about that, so I don't think so much about bank supervision. Could you speak a little bit about that and how that plays into this, how, how these you know, responsibilities are interconnected? Sure. I mean, so we focus around seven or eight agencies in this report, but the, you can think about them in buckets, right? So there's the banking regulator. So that's the Fed, um, the OCC and the FDIC. Their role is very specific to financial institutions. I mean, that's where a large part of their power comes to play. Clearly, the Fed has a, a broader market-wide role, role as well. The next bucket of rec uh, regulators we focused on are your market regulators. So that's the SEC um, and the CFTC. I'm imagining that this constituency, your audience, the, the folks in this call, understand the SEC's role, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. Right. Third set of recommendations um, focus on insurance regulators. We, we talk about it sort of somewhat simply, but that's an entire universe of regulators right there. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the universe of state insurance regulators, as well as the, the um, federal insurance office as well as a group called the NEIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which is like a, a trade group of insurance regulators that tends to coordinate action on key issues. And they've played a significant role on climate change. And finally, of course, the, the FHFA that focuses specifically on mortgages and the role of the FSOC in terms of coordination. Um, I know that I outlined pretty much 51 recommendations right now, but let me sort of go back to what sort of how Stephen categorized these recommendations. There are many recommendations, but they fall in four buckets, right? The first thing we want the regulatory community, community to do is affirm the systemic nature of climate change risks and to do the research, whatever their jurisdiction happens to be. We then want them to figure out how the industries that they supervise are integrating climate change into their risk management. That's what prudential supervision means. The third thing that we want every agency to do in all sorts of creative ways is to figure out how we get more climate change disclosures in the marketplace so that the next time we ask that poll question in your webinar, we have the answer going from 100% no to 100% yes. And the final thing we want them to do is, is to coordinate. Because as you pointed out, Michael, all of these recommendations sound kind of similar and that's because they are, right? So how do you make sure that the, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing? Um, and everyone is addressing these issues in ways that are reinforcing um, and that help us reach our overall, overall goal. And, and back uh, on, on the, um, I think it was on the Fed slide, you know, you talked about uh, the impact of what the Fed is doing for stimulus and the pandemic potentially. But, you know, if you look at the, the other two major crises or challenges that are in the news we're talking about today, the pandemic, not only this one, but what might happen in the future, and the challenge, whether you put it under Black Lives Matter or underserved, underrepresented communities, are also huge, huge, and they are connected. I mean, health, um, as folks who are in the in the climate change area know, is intimately connected to climate change, as are the underserved you know, and, and communities that are most vulnerable. Um, how do you see these? Do you see constituencies coming forward to ask the regulators to do that separately, or do you do you see um, some way that the dots could be connected earlier to say, you know, these other things are happening and clearly, you know, you, you need, that's another reason to think about climate change and to think about these other ones. Um, I'm happy to take a, call, a, a stab at this and I'm sure Stephen's gonna have some perspectives. I think, you know, what we're seeing play out over the past 
couple of months, right? The, the wildfires, the hurricanes, the rising sea levels. I think it shows us that um, climate change isn't going to happen on a coronavirus timeline, right? It's not going to wait for the pandemic to be done and sort of manifest. All of these impacts are happening right now. Um, and clearly the, the, you know, the inequities that are sort of endemic in our society, you know, play out in a whole host of ways. I mean, we, we just talked about how, you know, low income communities tend to be disproportionately affected by climate change. Well, low income communities all have also been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. They've also been disproportionately affected by, you know, economic uh, racial injustices that are a part of our society right now. So these are all interconnected problems. They, they need interconnected solutions. You know, a part of the solution, I think, is advocating for climate smart recoveries. So again, we've seen, you know, countries like Canada try to connect the dots. The EU, for instance, as a part of their stimulus package has, you know, made sure that 25% of it is earmarked to climate smart sort of solutions. You know, we've seen similar efforts from places like France. So I think that's a, that's a part of the solution. We We certainly feel that there are any sort of Financial regulatory response to climate change must be very conscious of um, impacts on low-income communities. That's the case that we try to make um, significantly through the report as well. But let me pass it to Stephen as well. Yeah, very briefly, I mean, I agree with obviously everything Venus said. One of the things that there's a discussion now is the role of the Community Reinvestment Act. And uh, obviously the, the Office of the Control of the Currency, FDIC and the Fed, there's conversations literally right now and we fundamentally believe, as Venus said, that uh, uh, community justice, racial justice is environmental justice, environmental justice is racial justice. So we have a number of recommendations there. And then to look at the housing uh, for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, through the Federal Housing Finance Agency, you know, one of the recommendations is that each of these large properties, 100 unit apartment buildings or whatever they may be, they should have their own climate assessment. Um, just as you, anyone on this on this um, on the session today could go to realtor.com, type in your home address, and you can see the risk of of of, of uh, floods in your in your based on flood maps. But you know we need to be able to do that for big properties as well. So we think that it's critical, and we've seen literally this week with everything else happening that people at the short end of the stick in economics are also you know, they're, they're short in the stick environmental. I just read a report last night that said there are also people in underserved communities are four times more likely to be affected by the range of environmental issues. Okay. So uh, there's kind of a, a, a really big question, but I think it really, I'm not going to ask it now because it really relates to the second, the next part which I'd like to move on to, which is, you know, for investment professionals looking at this and seeing a lot and thinking about, okay, so, you know, how do I think about watching what's going on here to see what is going to be most important to, you know, currently my, whether it's my work, my portfolios, my clients, and then how they might want to affect, uh, uh, you know, or step in or, you know, perhaps, you know, have their voice heard. So let's move on to that section and sure. look at what has happened and, and what comes, what comes next. That's great. Thank you, Michael. And next slide, please. Um, so, uh, so again, this report that we've outlined, we released in on June 1st. Then in the middle of July, um, the House of Representatives on on the uh, left side of the page, um, is, that's the, the US House Representative Climate Committee, they issued a 500 page plus report. And they have several recommendations about financial regulators that very much mirror ours, not in obviously the detail, but uh, is great. Then also in July, we organized a, net, a group of investors, uh, and so investors that represent about a trillion dollars of assets under management sent letters to all the agencies that FINA just went through, uh, urging them to act uh, quickly. Then, less than a month ago, the Senate, on the right side of this page, the Senate Climate Caucus, uh, so 10 senators co-signed this report, uh, and again, it covers a variety of issues, um, but they have a whole chapter starting on page 65 about financial regulators and we worked with them very closely so there's a lot of alignment on these and then if you go to the next slide as Vina talked about as Michael talked about just last week the commodity future trading commission there they have a they had a climate subcommittee and they came out with a very detailed report which is it, it, it's really historic in three ways and and as you can see from the cover there um, commissioner Ross Benham was the commissioner in charge, 
Bob Litterman, who many of you know, was the chair. They both did a remarkable job. Series, our CEO, Mindy Luber, was a member of the 34-member committee. It's remarkable in three ways. First is that in this administration, that a report that is so forward-leaning on climate issues, um, it, it came out. That's important. Number two, that they cover such a range of issues. They have 53 recommendations from carbon pricing to a lot of the things that we've covered in other areas. So it's a very comprehensive set. It's not just what the Commodity Future Trading Commission should do, but it's what the range of regulators that we've talked about should do at the state and federal level. And third is that the, the committee, which included bankers and agricultural, people from the agricultural sector and others, uh, and nonprofits and academics, voted 34 to zero to release it. So very significant in that sense. Um, so, it, and there's a lot of momentum on that. So next slide, please. Um, there's also been a lot of media uh, about this and, and more and more literally all the time about these issues uh, and the important role of financial regulators. Um, so I think the next slide is our emails, yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of details, but to kind of just take a step back, there's a lot of minutia here, and 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 Vina and I are happy to talk about any of the uh, kind of the details. But at a high level, if we're serious about our country becoming a climate leader, from the protection of our of portfolios, protection of the markets, the financial system, as well as the climate itself that we can't do without the financial regulators. And we have a set of recommendations in there. We'll also, uh, and again, the, the, some of this, the executive summary of the CFTC report is in your handouts in the, uh, the it's available. We'll also resend out to, uh, to you through Michael um, a sign-up letter that if you're interested in getting involved, as Venus said, if, if you have ideas, you have copies of reports, please let us know the ways we can work with you individually. And if you uh, want to co-sign and kind of endorse these recommendations, we're organizing another sign-on letter for that right now. So with that, let me turn that back to Michael to answer the question. Just uh, well, to what you just said, could you just briefly outline what what happened with the with the first sign on letter and the folks that were involved in that? Because that was fairly that followed fairly quickly on the report, and I know a number of investors were involved in that. They were. So so yeah. So we re reached out through our networks, and we had investors representing about a trillion dollars of assets. We had former members of Congress, bipartisans, important to emphasize, both Democrats and Republicans, heads of companies, heads of nonprofits, collectively sign a letter. It was really 65 or some number like that letter, basically to all of the state commissions as well as the federal agencies, asking them to say, climate is a systemic risk. We urge you to take these recommendations from series seriously and act on them right away. Um, so that generated a lot of momentum. That was released on July, middle of July, and we're now organizing another letter that we're, we released a week or two after the election. Okay. Um, and I, you know, going back, I think uh, to to the report from the CFTC subcommittee that that Bob did, and you know, Bob's obviously well known in our community, and he's well known to to us here in Boston because he was one of our keynoters, uh, keynote speakers. Uh, or five years ago and you know literally said the things then that he is saying now in the report what i found very striking about it and he emphasized is is the unanimity that the consensus they achieved and these were not all people chosen because they were you know on the right side of this issue they were chosen from across the board and i i, I find that encouraging and, and are you as you are following up with regulators or some of the folks in the coalition uh, are you finding that as well Yes. Yeah, so first is, um, I, first I agree with Bob's point. Um, it would it would be um, uh, disingenuous to say every meeting was unanimous. You know, you know, again, folks from lots of different industry has different perspectives on these issues. Uh, but it was a very healthy conversation. I also have to give Commissioner Benham and Bob Litterman great credit for their leadership. And you know, and leading a thoughtful discussion about that. But it was 34 to zero, and until the final vote, I didn't wasn't sure what, what it would be. Um, in terms of our meetings, so Vina and I and Monica and others, we've so far we've met with over 500 regulators and influencers, and more all the time. Um, literally, some today and some tomorrow. 
and uh, we appreciate obviously everyone who's on this on this today in your time. And we're finding a lot of support. Having said that, people are at different levels of information. Some they start a con. You know, I've had we've had many where Vina and I where the regulator might say, "Gee, is climate a systemic risk?" And either at the end of the call or by sending them information and having a follow-up call, they then say, "Yes, it's a systemic risk." Then the question is, "Okay, what should they do?" And so there's a lot of momentum. And Vina outlined a, a number of the examples of things. I can give you others if you want. And so in, in, if you had said to me when we issued the report on June 1st, there'd be as much momentum now, consider, and, and again, we issued the report, just to put it in context, the same week that the, tra the country saw the tragedy with George Floyd. And so there's been so many other issues that have happened in the last less than four months. So a lot more momentum than we would have thought, which we're very encouraged by. And we're working both at the state and the federal level uh, without being partisan, I don't think again, I don't think it'll surprise anyone to say, you know, depending on the results of the election, things will move in one direction may move faster than in others. But under either direction, we'll, we'll, we're going to see movement. Again, under this administration, under the current administration, San Francisco Fed did a big conference. The Richmond Fed is planning a conference. There have been several Feds that have issued reports, CFTC report. So there is momentum, uh, not as fast as we need but there's movement in the right. So yes, I think people are more aware. It's hard for anyone in the country to today to say, gee, nature can't affect the economy. Um, we're seeing it every day as we work from home, as we're seeing it in so many different ways, turning on the newspaper, turning on the TV or, 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 or those things. So I think there is greater awareness to that. You know, many people, I, I have two kids, my older son lives in Portland, Oregon. You know, he literally can't go outside he has an N95 mask, but even with that, you know, they have the second worst air quality in the world. Pacific Northwest is known as a beautiful part of the world um, because of the smoke. So it's affecting people in very personal ways that, uh, so I think it's getting, it's ra raising awareness as heartbreaking as that change is. I, I want to piggyback on something that you said earlier and, and go back again to some things, Bob's, one of the things that uh, that, that Bob said about the way this worked is that it you know didn't surprise me that the report that he, uh, he would share would be as kind of all-encompassing as it was. You know, it didn't just stick to the CFTC, um, and you know he explained that. But what I was struck by is Commissioner Benham, who was after all the, you know the commissioner who who asked for this report, made that very same case. I mean, he said very clearly, you know, he comes from an agricultural background when he was working for uh, a senator from Michigan. His focus was ag agriculture, and that's what brought him to this, wanting to address this issue, because he sees what's happening in the agricultural communities that, that he was very connected to. But he said he said that very clearly, too. He said, you know, this is, I, I did not want a report that just spoke to this, because everything that we do um, is impacted by all those other agencies. And I, I found that very, very striking. And I think that I, I would kind of commend folks to that who are looking at this, who are thinking, well, Geez, you know, it's that's kind of it, it's out there. It, it's not because it's so connected. Yeah, it, it is, as you say. All the agencies are, are connected, and you know the, the recommendations. If the recommendations are in place, it will affect every bank, every insurance company. That then through them, it will affect every major company. Um, you know, New Zealand just this week uh, started is is announced a plan over the next few years to roll out consistent mandatory climate disclosure for every company over a certain size. As Vina said, Canada did that for those who got support through their pandemic relief. Um, so we're seeing that happening, um, and we believe that the, the writings will happen in, in, in the U.S., and it will affect every industry um, and, and all these regulatory agencies. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and, you know, along those lines, I think the other uh, point, and, and you made it several times, but I think it's worth repeating because when most folks think of regulation, they think, well, first you've got to have an administration that wants to do it, and then it just takes forever to do stuff. And that's true. I mean, regulation is a deliberative, deliberate process, and it really has a huge impact when it's complete. But that said, what we heard from you in your report and what we heard very clearly from Bob is that all throughout these agencies, they have the, the authority they need now to take many of these steps. And maybe you could speak to that a little bit, because I think that, again, speaks to, you know, uh, for us, for investment professionals, seeing it, it isn't about waiting for, of saying, I don't have to worry about it, I'll wait till after the election and two years in, right? That this, this is something that could happen much more quickly. 
Right. And if you, again, you, you're first, you're exactly right. They do have the authority to act on it now. And you say, well, will they act quickly? Well, if you look back at the last six months, um, the pandemic, so look what the Federal Reserve, just alone the Federal Reserve and, and all the other agencies too, but they've done, you know, as a, the, what Congress has done is paramount, is critical, is important. Some may think it's too much, not enough. But in addition to that, the Fed has released roughly another three trillion in support. Again, we some of the programs we think are great. Some what their support of the fossil fuel industry we're not a big supporter of. But overall, they've taken broad leadership. Um, Vice Chair Quarles just a few months ago issued a guidance document about scenario planning for pandemic. Uh, that was new. They'd never done that before. A scenario planning, done scenario planning, but not for pandemics. Well, literally, if you go through that speech, uh, and I kind of read it, if you, if you, I'm being a little simplistic, but if you replace the word pandemic with climate change, um, it's exactly what we're asking them to do. And they did that within their own authority within a few months of the pandemic hitting. And and uh, Vice Chair Quarles of the Federal Reserve said, "Listen, I, as a Federal Reserve officer, I don't know when we're going to have." vaccines and banks don't know that but we should do scenarios i mean to be simplistic a good bad and awful scenario you know if it, if we can wrap it up soon if it takes longer if it takes a lot longer and we think every bank should do that well we think every bank should do again i'm being over simplistic on the comparison those kinds of scenario planning on climate um and they do it looking at their own portfolio that's something that most banks are not doing now the fed is not requiring or not even providing guidance. So that is a perfect example. And there are dozens of other programs the federal, uh, the Fed has put in place that municipal lending program and others that are the first time they've done this. And the same with SEC has done some things in there. But let me stop and see if Vina wants to add anything. I mean, I think the, um, I mean, I, I think Stephen's extremely comprehensive. I mean, uh, Michael, you'd asked a question saying like, what's the response, right? We're hearing from uh, regulatory agencies, will they act fast? I think the fact that Stephen and I have had 500 meetings since the report was released is an indicator. We're not kidding, we do multiple meetings a day with regulatory agencies at the federal level, at the state level, or, you know, a, a host of bodies. Irrespective of whether they approach this meeting saying, we fully agree with you or, you know, we don't agree with you. The fact that they're willing to do these meetings with us, I think, um, underscores just the the um, writing on the wall there. Sort of the the sense that they're seeing their global peers address climate change. They realize they're going to have to address climate change. So they are certainly looking to inform themselves at the very least. We can at least take that away. So I think that gives you a very very clear sense of um, just the the approach that these agencies have with these issues. We have met with almost every regulatory agency that we talk about in this report. Great, now that, that's terrific to hear. Well, as we get ready to wrap up, I have a few things and I'm gonna turn it back to both of you and for, for the final words. Uh, first of all, a reminder, we will have this uh, this session available uh, shortly. It'll be available through the CFA uh, Society of Boston website uh, and we, you will hear more from us. Um, your contact information is there. Certainly wanna encourage folks who are interested, either have uh, you know suggestions or interest perhaps in following up uh, or you know taking action on some of these things to reach out directly to you. I want to mention that uh, next Monday, the CFA Institute is going to release a, a report um, about uh, uh, climate change analysis and the investment process. And uh, we this, uh, here in Boston and our sustainable investing group and several other societies are collaborating with the Institute to uh, do a number of sessions like this on aspects of that report, which we will uh, do over the next month and a half. Uh, and we are going to sort of prepend this to those and make those all available through the CFA Institute uh, website because we think they will be a very comprehensive set of uh, uh, learning resources for folks whenever they come to this uh, to this topic. Um, and you know, it's just that you look for that. We will certainly communicate that as that as that rolls out uh, from uh, the CFA Institute and from these societies. They will be happening over the next month and a half. So there's a, a lot going on in this space. I want to thank everyone for their time today, um, and you know, certainly. Please feel free to follow up with us through the society here in Boston if there's things that you would like to see or get involved in. With that, I will turn it to you, Stephen and Vina, for uh, any final words before we close. Um, I just want to thank you. Thank you personally, Michael, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank Gary and the team from the society. Thank all of all of you who have listened in. Um, this is a complicated problem, and we need yeah. all of us kind of rowing in the same direction. 
And so we very much are taking seriously the idea of, we hope today has been helpful and we want your advice. We want your uh, information. We hope you'll get involved with this effort. So thank you very much. And let me turn it over to Vina. Just um, wanting again to thank you. This 90 minutes on any given day is not a short amount of time. So thanks for your time and thank you for your attention. And then finally, just thank you both for, for the work that you did on this report. It really, it really is phenomenal. And I'll encourage folks to look at your report and uh, to that executive. I mean, if you want to look at the 190 page report that this that Bob Letterman's committee did, uh, God bless you because I'm working through it. But even if you're not, the nine pages that we put here, which is executive summary, is well worth it in conjunction with with uh, the series report. I think you'll find it really uh, kind of opens up this whole topic for you and helps you helps you understand it. So thank you both, and thank you again. Thank all of you for participating today. Thank you.